All right. Thank you, Pam and Scott. We appreciate that. John chapter 1, if you've got a Bible there, we're continuing on with the apostles throughout this summer and in looking into uh, the uniqueness of some of these apostles. John chapter 1. Uh, we think a lot in life about, yeah, kids' church. Yeah, that's right. Kids make their way to children's church. Um, we think a lot about uh, relationships and family, and we think about our jobs, and we have a lot of things going on in our lives, and yet we don't spend enough time thinking, what's my legacy? What, what am I known for? What am I going to be known for? The depths of our character. But spend time on sports talk and spend time on figuring out how to get the car to run. All of these things consume us and often to the detriment of actually thinking about those things that are most necessary. We have a really great snippet on the apostle Nathaniel also going by the name Bartholomew. Nathaniel or Bartholomew is, is the name of this um, particular apostle. And we're going to learn some real depth. I mean, it's, we don't know much about him. But what we do know about him is quite significant. And we'll see how amazing he really is. Do you guys remember the story of Muhammad Ali on the airplane? He was uh, flying somewhere, and an attendant came by and said, uh, Sir, you need to put your seatbelt on. And in Muhammad Ali style, he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the attendant said, Superman don't need no airplane, so buckle up. <laughs> well, he was a big personality. There's no doubt about that. His one-liners were absolutely spectacular. He was probably the greatest athlete of the 20th century, and you look at how superhuman he really, his persona was. I want to compare that, interestingly, to Nathaniel, to Bartholomew. In some ways, he was just ordinary like the rest of them. But you see these traits in him that it made me sit back and go, oh, I, th I think I want to be like this guy. As out of reach as it may even seem to be, it's almost superhuman-like, pretty spectacular traits. So before we get into that first point, let me pray. Heavenly Father, please speak to us through this passage. Help us to apply some depth of thought to our lives, to who we are, to our legacy, by way of Nathaniel today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the only passage on Nathaniel, Bartholomew. This is it. He's mentioned in lists. That's how we know he's one of the twelve. He's at the ascension. So we know of his presence, but this is the only biblical story that we have of his. It's in John chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 45. So if you have a Bible, I hope that you do, you're in the habit of bringing your Bible. It says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the, the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, You need to come and see. And here it is. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how did, how did you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, that's like you believe, you will see greater things than these. 
And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This exchange is very unique. So we're dealing with an apostle that we have very little text about. Nothing negative. And we have this strange insight into who he is. It says a true Israelite. There was nothing false in him. He said of him. So he saw him coming. He goes, oh yeah, check him out. Like, I know who that is. This guy is a true Israelite with no deceit. It's his first words about his honesty and his character. It's evidenced, his first line, there's no deceit. There is one other passage that speaks of Nathaniel, and that is out of a book or books that are not in the New Testament of the same or similar era. Abdias is a bishop, was a bishop in Babylon, and there's actually a book of Abdias. He's thought to have been possibly one of the 70 that Jesus sent out. None of that is substantiated enough. It didn't rise to the level of what we have in the Bible. But in it, is the one description of Nathaniel Bartholomew. It says he was a man of medium height, very fair complexion, black curly hair, contrasting his big gray beard. He had a long straight nose and a powerful trumpet-like voice, a friendly and cheerful man. There it is. That's it. That's all we've got on this guy. As far as texts that deal specifically with his character, that's all we've got. And I think that very often we become a bit calloused in life. We have difficult things happen. We have difficult people that handle us roughly, that we end up hardened in time rather than softened in time. He was known for his character. He was known to have been extremely friendly and warm. He was known to have had the traits where there was nothing false in him. The Bible tells us to let our conversation be always gracious. Philippians says that we're to let our gentleness be evident to everybody. And yet, and yet, he had this this determination and strength in him that led to a horrible death. He held firm to the end, and yet he was so soft-hearted. How did he do that? I'm looking at passages in the Bible that support this. In fact, Dave Hapchuk and I were talking about this uh, Wednesday night, the idea that meek doesn't mean weak. Meekness is not weakness. He had both. There was a softness to him. But don't misinterpret the softness as push over or be just thrown with the wind. The Chronicles of Narnia, which of course are is classic literature, 1950s, 60s. He, uh, C.S. Lewis died in 1963, so whenever that was written before that, there's a great scene where Lucy, the little child, is talking to Mr. Beaver about the lion. And if you know the story, if you've read the book, if you've seen the movie, the beautiful lion with the beautiful mane is, is, a, is a Jesus God character in, in the book. I wanted to write down exactly how she said this. Yeah, Lucy had met him and now is inquiring. And she says of Mr. Beaver, is he safe? Mr. Beaver, is it safe? Who said anything about safe? But he's good. Safe? 
we have so much the picture of Jesus in the manger, but it's the same picture. Jesus comes back, King of kings and Lord of lords. Which is he? And the answer is yes. Oh, the meekest. Take his hand through his mane. Snuggle with him. But he's not tame. That's the picture, so much the picture of Nathaniel. He was soft. He was good. He seems like he was a really good guy. But man, determined? We have no idea. How determined? how focused, how principled he actually was. In fact, the second point tells us how disciplined he actually was. It says there is an unfortunate reason why Bartholomew is the patron of the saint of Tanners. Because he was flayed. How does a nice guy end up skinned, martyred, beheaded. How does that happen? This fisherman, as many believe that he was, he left that, committed himself to the preaching and teaching of the gospel in Armenia, which is north and east of Israel, until his violent death near the Caspian Sea. Although it may be difficult to see, I'm not sure if we can see this picture very well on the screen. It's one of the most famous, gives you an idea. I'm going to zoom in in just a minute, but that, does anyone know what that's a a picture of? Um, Janet, you've seen it. You saw that live. That, That painting is 45 by 50 feet. It's a fresco. So a fresco is where they take the plaster, it's wet plaster, and they add a powdered um, coloring to it, and you have to paint it like while it's wet. This is 30 years after the Sistine Chapel ceiling in the Vatican. This is the altar. This is at the front of the altar in Rome, Vatican City, Sistine Chapel. It's a spectacular sight if you ever have had the chance. We did. uh, Had an amazing tour. Uh, They provide, it's remarkable, they provide uh, a tour for the blind. It's a private tour if you're blind, and they take you to galleries that are uh, closed, and they literally are pulling sheets off of two, three thousand-year-old statues and allow Grant to feel them to feel the veins and the hands and the detail of work. We're actually able to walk to the front of this, move ropes to get up to the altar, then move ropes again, and we were right at the face of this. What it's actually unfortunately known for was Michelangelo painted all of those characters naked. And so that didn't go over really well. The complaint was, you know, it is kind of a church, And so the Pope got a lot of complaint, and then there was a famous painter that had to later paint uh, clothing on all of the paintings. And that poor guy became known as the painter of britches. That was all that he was known for. It was disgraceful. Um, Down in the, it's the judgment of, it's that judgment day, and there's horrible looking characters in it, and the apostles are all in it, and Jesus is in the center, casting wrath with his left hand. And down, and then a little to the right, is, uh, is Nathaniel. I don't know if it's going to come up any better, but let's take a look at the next one. That's the famous, that is the famous caricature of Nathaniel. He's over his, in his left hand is his flayed skin. Uh, the face is, ironically, the face which, again, took a lot of the attention away from Nathaniel. The face is actually Michelangelo's. 
he actually painted his own face in that as, um, as one that was, uh, have an empty soul. And so he overpowered the painting overall. In his right hand was the knife. He was so likable, friendly, apparently this personality, yet determined to death for what he believed. We too can set our hearts on the same. Where's that deep principle? And I see more today than I have ever seen. I actually see today the principled in pet peeves. I see a lot of deep principles there. And whatever it is, I'm not talking just the church, I'm just talk, talking overall. Don't get him on that subject because he's principled as if that's a positive thing. No, we're careful of what we're principled about. As a church that exists according to Matthew 28, we exist together as a family organized as designed in the New Testament with elders and deacons. We exist as a family of God to reach a lost world for Jesus Christ, period. There it is. Discipleship, evangelism, and discipleship, that's why we're here. Where's the deep principle for that? Oh, we have deep principles on about every other subject, including politics. Our deepest should be, are we seeing people come to know Christ? Are we seeing people discipled in their faith? And yet the differences and the, the division on various things that make no difference at all. I mean, no difference. But it's almost like we'll die for it. And we're like, back off about eight steps and look at the big picture. That which we are most principled about doesn't matter. So, so long as we're principled about little insignificant pet peeves or they're true to something that's not true, but it's lower on the scale of making any difference at all, while we're all concerned about things like that, we have a community that doesn't even know that we exist. <laughs> How about that? I mean, that's dreadful. We could disappear tomorrow. And it might not make the front page. I know you don't want to be that way. I know I don't want to be that way. I want to make a difference in our community. We have wonderful nonprofits in town that many of you volunteer at and give to. And we say hooray to that and more of that. Let's do more of that. Why? To be nice and kind of you. Yeah, keep going. Oh, to, to, so people aren't hungry. Yep, keep talking. There's more. So they can get jobs. Yep, I want that too. And I want families to stay together. Keep going. All of that. So that people come to know Jesus Christ, are discipled in their faith to reach other people for Christ. Now that will die for. How you baptize or when you baptize, I have my opinions, and I think they're pretty solid based on the scriptures of who needs to be baptized, but that ultimately is going to make the life-changing decision in somebody's life. Be different. I, that's fine. That's, that's down here. It's minor. Important? Yes, minor. The major. We major on the majors. None of these apostles, which all but one were martyred, they didn't get martyred because of some strange view on how it is we're supposed to meet. <laughs> right? I mean, that's not what they were killed for. They were killed specifically with the message of Jesus Christ that we are sinners and lost without a Savior. Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice for us, rose from the dead, conquered death, and belief in him brings union with God. That's what they died for. One other point that's worth noting about Nathaniel. It's the third point. Out of everything that we said in that 
that one story, and it's, yet it's extended. It's, it would be in the category of unique mention of an apostle. It's unique for several things. Jesus commented on him before he even made it to him. Then he actually mentions, yeah, I I knew you before. I saw you. What? Creeper, what? What do you mean you saw me before? He goes, no, I saw you sitting under the olive tree. He's like, you did? Yeah. Yeah. But why that story? Why would that be the one to mention? Why did Jesus take note of it, and why did he mention it? How do you know me? This is verse 48 of John 1. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Rabbi, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Jesus says, because I said that I saw you under the fig tree? That's why you believe? Well, if, like, if you're impressed with that, he said, you will see greater things than these. Surprised that he took note. But why sitting under the fig tree? It was even considered that the tree, the fig tree, was an extra room. So you may have a house where you have a little private area where you can, maybe, maybe you have an office, you're fortunate enough to have an office at your house. Could be your dining room table, right? A lot of us do that. So that corner of it, that's, that's your area. It might be some little area in your bedroom. You have this little private area that's for thinking, for reading. It's the lounge chair that has a little place for your tea or your coffee and quiet. That's what it was. That's what the olive tree was. It was specifically for contemplation. It was for the deep thoughts of life. That's why the mention. It wasn't just, oh yeah, I saw you mowing the yard. No, it was more than that. Oh, I saw you drawing water at the well. No, nope, that wasn't. I saw you sitting under the tree, and Jesus was like, that's the guy. Look at that guy. In all of Israel, there's nobody like that. There's no deceit in this guy. So it made me wonder what we are in those private devotional, no, not devotional, in those contemplative times is who we are. We are not who we see in public We are who we are in private. That is a general principle overall. Watching tennis, I used to love to watch Serena Williams play. She's not related. I used to love watching her play. I mean, she's spectacular. But that's, don't look at Sunday or on Saturday, right? Finals of tennis, Sunday or Saturday for the gals. Don't watch that and think, oh, that's who she is. No, who she was, was the 50 hours a week during the week in the weight room and practicing. That's who she is. You want to be a great tennis player? Don't imitate what she did on Saturday. Imitate what she does Sunday through Friday. You, you aren't who you are sitting here. We could be anybody we want to be here. We are who we are in the privacy. Our contemplative moments throughout a week when we're alone, that's who we are. Ultimately, also can't be hidden. And I'm like, I'm studying, I'm reading this this week. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to us, and I'm part of this. And Philippians 4 came to my mind. Whatever things are pure, whatever things, brothers, whatever is noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, 
think about these things. Romans 12, don't be conformed by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's, it's your mind. That's why the story with Nathaniel and Bartholomew, why he pointed out, oh, this guy, see the one with Philip? A true Israelite, in him no deceit. Then says to those around, after saying that, he goes, yeah, I saw you. Because how do you know me? I saw you. I saw you under the tree. That's the kind of guy I want, whose waters run deep. So if you are who you are in the privacy of your life, who are you? That's, that's like the point. We all put our best foot forward. We all want to look right. Of course we do. It's social. I don't have a problem when we ask people, how are you, and everyone says, I'm fine, thanks. I don't mind. It's social. That's all it is. They're just, they're just generally asking how you're doing. Yeah, we share a little bit. Ah, oh, I struggle this week. Oh, tell me about it. And we just chat. It's not a time to unload everything because in public, we kind of put on the best. That's good. That's okay. But who we are is who we are in private. Who are you in private? Not a guilt thing. This has nothing to do with that. It's just to put a light on it and to say, you too can be a Nathaniel. You can be a Bartholomew. It's that time of contemplation. He just hit a handle on it. And it showed. It showed by that wonderful balance where he was, he was the man when it came to principle to the things that mattered. But he also apparently was just a good guy. People liked him. What a balance. Different things uh, growing up, I remember, um, uh, talk show-wise. And there was an old, old episode that I just thought was hilarious. It was David Letterman. He was interviewing Goldie Hawn. Okay? So, um, whatever. And he said something like, how long have you been Goldie? And she goes, well, you know, it just seems like my early life as I was exploring the depth. And David Letterman goes, no, 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 no. This isn't Barbara Walters. I'm saying, how long has your name been Goldie? Like, you're thinking way too deep. I just want to know where your name came from. And she goes, oh, that's right. I forgot who I was talking to also. Well, that's the question. Who are you? Who, who actually are you? That's what the apostles are doing for us. They all had negative traits. So when you say, oh, I'm going to be known for, and you name something negative, no, that's not fair to you. All the apostles had some pretty negative things about them. We didn't hear about Nathaniel's, but he had them too. But positively, what is your legacy? What is it that you're known for? Who are you? What are those strengths? So they, they build a statue of you. And I hope it's not going to have your skin laying over your left leg uh, and a knife in the other. I hope that's not what we're known for, but all the apostles were known for something. In many of them, it was their death. Others, it was what they did, Peter holding the keys. And there's always something. Whatever it is that we want to be known for, the path to it is what we do in privacy. It's not what we're doing in public. Volunteer more. Yeah, absolutely, volunteer more. And go ahead and do that, and people see it, and good, that's okay. Participate. But the strength, the furnace that keeps it going, the depths of what we're committed to and who we are happens in the privacy of our own life, wherever that, that olive tree is for you. Whatever that time alone in contemplation, that time. 
and how that time carries into your life and makes you become what we ultimately see in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful. Lord, um, another amazing apostle. Lord, you, you're really remarkable, and you left us just the right amount of information. So I pray in response that we would take more captive in our life the privacy, the development of our character, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.